God just says, just a little bit more time. Just spend a little bit more time in my presence. The Bible says that Jesus tore the veil in the most holy place when he died so that we can have access into the presence of God. How beautiful a God we serve who wants us as close to him as we can possibly be. We love you, Jesus. How many of you guys are grateful for a God who makes all things new? Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. You can be seated. Um, I get to share the word of the offering today. I know CFF is a church that loves to give, a church that understands how much was given to us, that God gave his very best for us, and we love to give to God. Amen. I want to share something short that's found in Acts chapter 2. Tell the person next to you, you better act somebody. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Acts chapter 5, sorry. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. It says, but there was a certain man named Ananias. What was his name? And he had a wifey, and her name was Sapphira. And they sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I read parts in the Bible that make me feel encouraged, make me feel loved, make me feel strengthened. And then I read other parts that it's like, dang, God, 
that seemed kind of harsh in my opinion. This guy, he conspired with his wife to sell a property. I don't know if it was a field that they were going to build a, a, a house in or if it was an actual house, but they sold it. And then they only gave a portion of it to the apostles and said, this is all that we got for what we sold. And so we're giving it to the church. And, and the Bible says that they were lying not to Peter, but to God, and that they literally died that very same day. I'm like, dang, God, I've done some worse stuff. Thank you for not killing me, right? But there's a couple things. There's a reason why God included this in the word, because there's something that he wants you and I to learn from this. And so one of the first things that I see right away, if you're taking notes or not, is that deception is a big deal to God. Deception is a big deal. We say things like, oh, it's just a little white lie. But to God, it's not little. The Bible says that God hates lies. Do you know that the name for the devil is literally the deceiver? Diablos is the deceiver. And so what the problem with Ananias and Sapphira was not that they only gave a small offering. It wasn't that, that they were struggling to trust God in the finances. The problem was that they want everybody to see them as these great men and women of God. They wanted to appear as these holy, great men and women of faith. And they said, we're giving everything. But the problem wasn't that they only gave a small amount. The problem was this deception that was in their heart. And we have a God of truth. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. And so I see from this that God takes deception very seriously. Sometimes we want to appear a certain way when in reality it's better to just say, hey, I'm struggling with my finances. I'm struggling to give. That's just where I'm at right now than to try to appear a certain way. You guys get that? Another thing that we, we can learn from this story is that humility and transparency are super important. I thought to myself, how different of a story would this have been if Ananias and Sapphira would have gone to Peter and they said, hey, honestly, we felt the Holy Spirit tell us to sell this and to give to the church, but I, I, can't, I don't feel like I have enough faith to do it. Peter, my pastor, my leader, I just feel like, man, I got to provide for my children. I, I don't know if I can really trust God with the whole amount. What a different story would it have been? You guys know what I'm saying? The Bible says that Peter later told his wife, is this the full amount? Are you sure this is the full amount? The Holy Spirit was given an opportunity for them to be humble and to be transparent, but they refused that opportunity. I don't know if you guys are catching this, but I believe there are some people here that you have a really hard time when it comes to trusting God and your finances. And there, all of us here, there are areas in our lives that we struggle to trust God fully. There's areas in my life, there's areas in your life. And that wasn't the big deal, the big problem. There's some of you here that when it comes to this time, you feel guilty, you feel condemned because you know you haven't been faithful to God. And so you rather not even hear it. You think about it. Some of you here, you're like, I got a family. I got to pay my bills and I'm barely making ends meet. And, and you come to this time and you feel ashamed. You feel condemned. And I believe that God is trying to teach us, be humble, be transparent, talk to somebody about it. If you know you're struggling, if you know you have arguments, some people here, they have arguments. Why does the church always want to take my money? Why do I have to give 10% to God? Why this? Why that? And it's better for you to be honest about your arguments and your struggles and talk to leadership, talk to your pastors, than to allow the enemy to whisper into your ears. You can't talk to anybody about this. They're going to they're gonna think about you. How, how can you struggle with something like this? I thought you were a person of faith. Maybe about a month, a month and a half ago, I sat down with one of my disciples, somebody who loves God, somebody who I love, and I had to confront him in this area about his unfaithfulness to his tithing. He loves God. He's a great, awesome man. But in this area, he had, he had stopped tithing for a long time. And, and I had to talk to him about it and sit him down and tell him what the word of God says and tell him, God loves you. He wants to bless you. He's not trying to take anything from you. But when you hold back, when you rob God, you give the enemy access to an area of your life. You know what happened? He felt embarrassed, but he felt set free afterwards. Because something that he was keeping inside, a struggle that he was having, that he was hiding, it finally came out to the light. He was finally able to talk to somebody that loved him about this. And ever since, 
I talked to him today. He talked to me. He was telling me about all the blessings that God had been pouring into his life ever since he made that decision to trust God, to be faithful with his tithing. He's been hearing God a lot better. God's been opening up opportunities in his job. And I told him, look, I'm not God, but God's word says if you are faithful to him, he will open up the floodgates of heaven. I'm not promising that. God is prom And I told him, I'm so excited for you because you're about to see the blessing of God in your life. And he's, he's seeing the blessing after blessing. But it came from understanding I need to be open. I need to be transparent. And so I want to pray for, for you guys because maybe some of you, you're like, I'm always faithful in my tithing. But maybe there's other areas that you're, that you're listening to the voice of the enemy that says, hey, just keep silent. They won't understand you. And, and God is not trying to teach us that if you don't give, he's going to kill you, right? It sounds like that, but I think God is trying to teach us the importance of transparency, of not being deceitful, but being honest about where you are in your circumstance. Amen? So please close your eyes with me. God, we, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you because we get to give to you, God. That it is such a blessing and that doesn't just bless our lives, but the ger generations that will come after us. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you give strength to, to those who are struggling in this area of their finances to open up, God, to bring it out to the light, to, to say, I need help, but I, I want to be faithful to you, God, but I just need some help, Lord. I pray that you give courage and you give strength, Lord. We love you, Jesus Christ, so much. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you, church. Why don't we give Jesus a big round of applause? A little bit louder if it's for him. How about that? Before you sit down, before you sit down, I want to give somebody a high five. Tell them you look amazing tonight. You look really, really good. Now, what a blessing it is to be in the house of God. You may be seated. Um, I have a word from God. I, I've been uh, wanting to share it with you. I believe God's going to do something amazing. Today is uh, Formation Friday, and that we will have formation. Um, I believe with all of my heart, all of my heart, that God is preparing you for something incredible. Um, in every area of our life, preparing the church and preparing the disciples within the church in their own personal lives to take you to a whole nother level. Amen. Uh, we cannot afford to live self-centered lives. We have to be generous with our lifestyle, generous with our lives. We have to learn that what God is trying to do with us, it goes beyond our likes and dislikes. It goes beyond our feelings. But it's a need in this world, a desperate need. The Bible says that the world awaits with eager expectation the revelation of the children of God. What does that mean? That the world is expecting, waiting, anxiously waiting to see what a real Christian looks like. What a real son of God or a real daughter of God looks like. The world is waiting for your Christianity to come alive. Amen. Amen. Before we get to the sermon, I want to show you guys something cool. Uh, we have tomorrow one of the coolest events we've done so far. Uh, if you don't know, tomorrow is the final of the uh, Copa, uh, Copa de Oro, right? Which uh, It's Brazil versus Argentina. It's the final, okay? This is Messi versus Neymar, right? You probably don't get many more years watching this star. He's incredible, right? He's, I, I know people talk about other, other soccer players. There are none. Th this is the guy, right? He, we are 
I tell people, whenever you, you, you see this guy, you're honored, you're privileged to see the talent. Uh, it's just amazing. And I taught him everything he knows. So anyway, so that's him. And then Neymar, uh, you guys know about him anyway. I don't need to explain about the soccer teams, but tomorrow's a final, uh, you know, and it starts at 5 p.m. right here. Now, check it out. We're going to do a men's event. Men, tomorrow, if you cannot bring somebody to church with this, you have a hard time inviting. Um, or you just got bad credit with people, you know? Uh, there's, no, I'm just kidding. You know, sometimes it takes time. But after that, we're going to share a, a, you know, a word, brisket and pizza, okay? Brisket and pizza. For a few minutes, we're going to do 10 minutes just thanking God. We're going to share literally like a seven-minute word, super, super quick. Bring people to the feet of Jesus, right? So it's game, word, fight. And then we're going to finish it with the, one of the biggest events in UFC history, McGregor Trilogy, and, uh, and it's just going to be incredible, right? It's going to be an amazing fight card. And, uh, and I mean, it was sold out in seconds. That's not just me putting it there. It really was sold out in seconds. But what the heart of this is, is not just our entertainment. Although it's going to be awesome in the big screen with amazing sound. You've never watched a fight like that before. Uh, the next best thing is going there in person. Uh, but I just really encourage you guys to bring your brother, bring, you know, that one friend you grew up with that, that doesn't really believe that God's doing something in your life. You know, bring that one neighbor, uh, you know, that, that all you hear is, ah, screaming in the games, but, you know, they never really, really connect with the church. Maybe their mom, their, their wife goes to church, but he doesn't. Does that make sense? This is a great opportunity. We start at 5 p.m. and we finish at 10 p.m. So, guys, uh, you should have scored enough points with your wife already and to where you get to be about five hours alone. Is that cool? If not, it's a church event, so you guys are, you know, it's good. So uh, uh, anyway, uh, last, last thing about this, we do need, uh, we're going to leave the chair set up afterwards. So set up crew, you have no work today. Tomorrow, we're all going to, all the men are going to be getting it done pretty quick. So today, we're going to leave everything set as it is. Speaking of which, we need hands, we need muscle. We need men and women that are willing to serve. Amen. We need to serve, right? A lot of people uh, don't realize this, but 80-20 rule applies in church too. 80-20 rule tells you this. 80% of the people, no, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. That happens in your company. If you're a salesperson, you know that 80% of the sales happen by 20% of the people. If you know that that happens in school, right? Uh, I'm going to tell you this right here, right now. We all need to serve. This church is not built on the talent of a few, but the sacrifice of many. Am I making sense? There's something we can do. I love to see the little kids helping out with the chairs after service. To me, that's the heart of CFF. We serve because that's who we are. We're servants and servants of the living God. Amen. So if, lend, your hand, lend, lend your hand to service. That doesn't mean just whenever you have time, whenever you can. I mean, do something where you say, God, this is how it feels, okay? If you see something out of place and if it's bothering you, God maybe put it in you so you can help fix it. Right? Does that make sense? So if there's something you want to do, something you want to dream of doing, if there's a ministry you want to you wanna say, hey, God, I feel like maybe there's need in the community for this, and God puts a burden in your heart, we want to support that. We want to make sure that that happens. Am I making sense? But for right here, right now, we have latent needs. And so just lend your hand to God and watch Him do something amazing with it. Is that cool? Yeah. yeah you guys good? Yeah. Okay, okay, cool, cool. So how to get committed, how to get involved. Okay, there's many different ways. But one of those ways is uh so i feel like i need to pose or something these lights are like awesome but anyway there's a lot of different ways to get involved one of those ways though is going to be next friday next friday after service if you want to you know serve next friday after service we're going to be here i'm going to talk about the different teams and the different uh you know uh, areas of ministry where we serve like the sound team the production team you know uh the the video video team uh you know uh, there's a lot of different areas uh, that you know the band there's different ways so many different areas to serve so we're going to talk about that how to get committed after next friday after service is that cool yeah. no you guys okay yeah. all right good 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 cool 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 sounds good okay actually you know what let's make it quicker we'll make it sunday after service in there is that cool Sunday after service in there, though, we'll wait another week. Okay, let's do this. Let's, let's pray and let's get down to the word. Dear God, thank you so much for tonight. I ask you, God, that you remove all arguments. Lord, that anybody here that perhaps their hearts are, are having a hard time, God, being in this place. Maybe they're annoyed at someone or at something. Maybe in me, God, or at the sound, or they're getting distracted by something. I pray, God, that you remove all obstacles that I know, God, the enemy is trying to put so that they will not receive your word. Because it is your word and it is your spirit that will bring transformation into our lives. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, please remove all obstacles. Break down walls. God, will you kick down the doors of their hearts so that your love can come in and do an amazing work. Holy Spirit, will you please confront us today with your word. 
and help us to understand that we need so much growth if we're going to get to the place where you want us to go. Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful church, these amazing people, and the lives that you're building, the families, God, that you're strengthening. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Cool, cool. So today I want you to do something and tell the person next to you with a lot of authority, this sermon is for you. All right? If somebody didn't tell you because they don't know you, but turn to the other person. Now turn to the other person and tell them, no, 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 this sermon is for you. The sermon is for you. All right. All right. Cool, cool. The sermon is for you. Uh, this is one of those uh, where you realize, oh, man, that guy's got to hear it. That guy's got to hear it. But when that happens inside of, <laughs> oh, you guys are already going, okay, uh, <laughs> all right, go, go. So what happens is this, is we always think that the word is for somebody else, but when God really has a word for you, sometimes people get mad at me and they say, Pastor, uh, I feel like you were talking to me. And I'm like, you should be really happy because you just got a private sermon. Like God just gave your word to somebody. And, uh, and, and I, I'm just asking, seriously, did you come so that God would speak to you? If so, don't get mad when he does. Right, because sometimes we get really upset because we think, you know, that person, and like, I don't, I don't even read Instagram. No one's telling me stuff. You know, I don't preach sermons. You're not that important that I'm going to preach one sermon just for you. But God consider you, considers you that important that he will give you his word. Is that okay? We started already offending people already. I can already feel it. <laughs> okay, cool. It's okay. It's okay. But it's true, though. It is the truth. If you came here, it's because you came so that the word would minister to you. The Bible says that the, the Bible is like a double-edged sword that cuts all the way down to the bone marrow. You know how deep that is? It's not just flesh wounds. It goes all the way in so that it can actually change you all the way in here. Am I making sense? So today God will do something amazing. And uh, today's title, uh, if we could just go ahead and go to the presentation. Today's title is this, um, Tough Times, Tougher Disciples. Tough Times, Tougher Disciples. Tough Times, Tougher Disciples. I'm going to read out of Jeremiah chapter 12. I'm going to go from verse 1 through verse 5. Today I'm going to be a little bit more methodical. I'm going to try to break it down, and I'm going to try to be as accurate as I possibly can. Some of you who are here for the first time, I don't usually do it like this. I don't normally have a presentation. I don't normally go. I just kind of flow. But today, I want to make sure we don't miss any part of this chapter, of these five verses. Because I know that God wants to do something incredible. Now, if I feel like you guys can handle a little more, and if we, if we are receiving and, and, and you guys are open and ready, I'll take you guys to the very last part, which is in the book of Revelation. Now, that's eschatology. Eschatology means the end times. If you know, this church doesn't talk all the time about the end times. I feel like there's enough to deal with today, now, that we don't need to be worried and concerned about the end of the days, because they'll happen when they'll happen. What I do need to know is that we need to be prepared for those days. And my question is this, is this church prepared? Now, I'm not going to talk about end times unless you can handle the today times. Okay, so if we can handle the today times, then we're going to talk about the end times. Is that a fair? Is that a good contract? Yeah? And, uh, and uh, also as time allows it and all that stuff. So I got 26. That, that clock is fast. That's not fair. It's 26. Look how fast it's going. Look back there, guys. Look at that big old clock they're putting on me. I'm not, I rebuke that clock. Stop it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> anyway, so Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1 through 5. This is Jeremiah. Jeremiah. He is amazing. Okay, if I have another son, he will be named Jeremiah. But I'm not going to. Three boys is enough. Right? So there's this man. His name is Jeremiah. He's the one that said in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Well, let's hear it. Let's see me. One disciple that knows that. What does it say, Frank? For I know. Says the Lord. All right? For I know the plans I have for you. What kind of plans? To prosper you. And a hope. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool, cool. So this is the man who's encouraged so many of us. His first chapter is the verse, the chapter that I took as my life rema. It's the one where I, where I didn't think I had enough, or I didn't know enough, or I still feel that way sometimes. And I go back to those verses is where the Lord says, I've called you as a prophet over the, over the nations. I've called you. Do not be afraid of their faces. Don't say that you're young. By the way, I'm not that young anymore, so that verse will be one of yours pretty soon. Am I making sense? But this is where, where, where God spoke to me so much and removed so many of my fears. But then I jumped to chapter 12, and God began to show me something real about people who serve God. Something so normal, so human. Sometimes we can look at people and think that they're doing so well because they know God for so long. Or they've been serving for a long time, or, or maybe they read the Bible or know the Bible. And you can begin to think that somebody has no struggles. But this is the struggle of a man of God greater than you and, my, and, my, and me. Far greater than we have been so far. And he has struggles, great struggles. I want, to share those I want to share those struggles with us today. Why? Not so that we can have an excuse to give in to our struggles, but so that we know how God answers when we feel that way. 
Sometimes we see people in the Bible giving us great examples. But sometimes you see examples of failures. Great kings that fall. Men and women of God that make mistakes. That's not to blame them or to, to, to say, yeah, yeah, that's right. But rather to say, God, show me how not to fall, how not to go down that same route. Sometimes our parents make mistakes, our leaders make mistakes, pastors definitely make mistakes. The Lord will begin to show you the amazing things of people. But if He shows you the downfalls, it's not so you would apply them to your life or so you make excuses for your softness, but rather so you could say, God, show me how to digest properly people's lives. Oh, did you hear what I just said? Show me how to digest properly people's lives. Meaning, you gotta eat it like fish. Any of you guys ever eaten a mojarra? You know, mojarra, I don't call that, how do you call that? Uh, what's in English? What's in English? What? Tarp. It is, is carp? Carp? Well, it's cool. Yeah, nobody knows. Let's say it's carp. All right, fried carp. You know, it's like you, the whole thing, and it's got the, the, the spines all over. And if you don't know, you're going you're gonna to eat it like chicken. You're going ah, to dig into it. But you cannot do that. You have to eat it and just take out the, take out the, the little bones, you know, take out the little spines. You cannot eat it with the spines. It's delicious. And the same thing happens in people's lives. Same thing happens in the Word of God. You've got to digest and know how to be mature enough. You don't do that with kids, by the way. You don't feed a three-year-old, uh, 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 what do you call it, a tart, cart? Let's just call it mojarra because that's what I know it as, okay? And so you don't need to eat a mojarra frita to a three-year-old, right? You, you have to digest it for them. Well, today, you grow up a little more. Today, we're going to eat it whole. Today, we're going to say, God, I'm going to have to digest it. Nobody's going to feed and treat me like a baby today. Today, God, God, God is going to get real with us. Is that cool? Okay, cool, cool. So Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1. This is the king, I mean, this is the prophet being angry at God. He's upset. He's been serving God for now 40 years. I don't know how long. He's been going at it. He's been doing what God's called him to do. And he gets to this place where his people are going through tough times. His people are enslaved. Even worse, even worse, other people are prospering. People that don't know God. Here's what happened. He is this prophet of God who tells the truth. And yet there's all these other prophets in the land that all they talk about is nice stuff, prosperity. All they, they do is they tickle people's ears and they're listening to them. And no one's listening to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is mocked. He's, he's kicked out. He, his own family hired an assassin to kill him. I'm not telling you. This is the truth. Now, if you have problems, you don't have this kind of problems. That your family hires an assassin to take you out. This is Jeremiah. That's how much people begin to hate him because of the message of repentance that he brings to the people. It's crazy, isn't it? He's in a very tough time. And he begins to dialogue with God. Let's begin with that dialogue. Let's go. Verse 1, it says, Righteous, uh, we're going to have to speed up the transitions. Okay. Let's speed up the transition. Let's take out the transition. Okay. Righteous are you. Oh, can you guys read it with me? Is that cool? All right. I'll go like this so you guys can all see it. Ah. Okay. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you. Yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Hold on right there. This is him telling God, you are so righteous, you are good. He begins to sweeten it up. And then he says, by the way, let me talk to you about your judgments. Okay, now. Okay, prophet. Chillax. Okay, this is him trying to tell God, let me, let me, let me kind of share with you how to be a judge. Because, you know, I got judgment too. Whenever you start walking down that path as a believer, you're getting in very dangerous grounds. When you think that God doesn't know enough. Here we go. Let's keep going. Yet let me talk to you about your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? If you're not careful, you can begin to think that God is making a mistake. You can begin to think that God doesn't know what the heck he's doing. If we're not careful, we can begin to think that God somehow, some way took a break. But God never takes a break. He begins to tell God, why are these people prospering it begins to weigh heavy in his heart the bible says something hope deferred makes the heart sick but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life when hope is deferred you begin to get sick when you pray for healing and that person doesn't heal when you pray for that person to love you and the person doesn't love you back when you pray for prosperity and you seem to get in a deeper hole when you pray for something when you pray for revival in your life and all you feel is like you're just barely in survival mode right sometimes when you delay the blessings or when god delays his hand of blessing over you your heart begins to get sick how many of us as believers have seen someone else walk away from their faith why because they delayed because god took too long well, i'm here to tell you point number one that god is always on time he's never late he's never ever ever late give god a round of applause if you believe that 
God is never late. If he's doing something, he's up to something. I'm telling you, if he's doing something, there's something else behind the scenes. God is always working something. If your miracle hasn't happened here in the natural, it doesn't mean it hasn't already been granted in the supernatural. Now, some of us can be very, 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 very materialistic. Materialistic doesn't mean that all you like is Gucci and, and, and Prada and, and Louis Vuitton and, and um, I don't know what other brands, and Yeezys and all these different things. That, that's not what materialistic is. I mean, that could be, it, it could be displayed in that way in sometimes, if that's what you place value in. Materialistic means this, that all you see is the material and you don't realize that there's a spiritual realm as well. You can be very humanistic instead of theistic, which means you can see only what's human. You can see only what's here and don't realize that there's a behind the scenes that was here before you and I ever came into this world. But God is working in the background. Amen. God is working in the background. I see it kind of like this. Just like you see this whole thing happening, there's people working in the background. There's someone clicking buttons. There's someone running cables. There's someone making sure the sound is good. Someone making sure the lights are on. Just like that, the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. And even though something seems like it hasn't turned on, something seems like it's not working, He's always working in the background. Come on. Next, let's go to the next verse. You have planted them. Yes, they have taken root. Meaning, God, you do everything, so I know you did this too. They grow. Yes, they bear fruit. You're near in their mouth, but far from their hearts. Oh man, Jeremiah begins to get mad. One thing is for delayed blessings to come to you, but a slap in the face is when it comes to somebody else. Especially somebody who doesn't seem to deserve it. Jeremiah begins to say, God, what is wrong with you? What is happening? One thing is that you're not blessing me, but now you're blessing this person. And I know this person. And if I know them, you know this person. They say, God, God, but in here is just a cuss word. Am I making sense? They worship only because of her, because of him, because of that. But in here is not real. And he begins to get mad. And I tell you what, if we're not careful as Christians, we can do the same thing. And we can begin to think that somehow, some way, is unfair. Well, God is not asleep, and he is not unfair. Am I making sense? We think, we think that we are deserving and somebody else is not. Well, let me tell you this. None of us are deserving. None of us. Everything you have and everything I have is grace given. And if you're not careful, we can become very ingrate, ungrateful. Everything I am, everything I have, and everything you have, and everything you are is grace given. Yeah. Buddy, you're on borrowed time. You know, I used to hate it when I would go to places, and people would call me buddy or boss. Hey, boss, hey, boss. I'm like, I don't even know who you are. But if I'm your boss, you're fired. I'm just kidding now. You know, I'm like, why are you calling me boss? Why are you calling me boss? You ever have people like that? You show up at our zone, they call you boss, boss, boss. I'm like, if I'm your boss, give me a 20% discount right now. You know, but here's the thing, boss, everything you have is his anyway. And everything the person next to you has, belongs to God anyway and here's the thing we can get so mad because we could not only begin to think that God is unfair but we begin to think that we are the owners and we begin to think that we could distribute God's resources better than him if you're not careful you begin to you begin to covet what other people have and you begin to think that God is unfair well, I want to tell you this that is never unfair and you can never outgive God the Bible says, do not grow tired of doing good for in due season. If you do not lose heart, you will reap a great harvest. But do not grow tired of doing good. Why? Because in due season, when? In due season, when? In due season, when, pastor? In due season. When? When God says, in due season, you will reap a great harvest. A great harvest. You know what that means to me? Not just enough for me, but enough to bless those around me. Yes, even those that cursed me. Please say amen. Because when God gives, he gives abundantly. Amen. Let's go a little bit further because I love these next two verses. Actually, the, the last verse is what I'm really running towards. But man, I cannot skip these. Let's go to the next one. But you, O Lord, know me. You have seen me. You know me. And you have tested my heart toward you. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter. Ooh. And prepare them for the day of slaughter. Let me, give you how, let me tell you, God, how to deal with these treacherous people. Let's kill them. That just got in, that went from 0 to 60 really quick, like really quick. I don't know who he had in mind, but he had someone in mind. I know you guys are too good of believers to say that kind of stuff. But you probably wouldn't mind if somebody wasn't around no more CFF. And that's just not how it works, is it? You probably wouldn't be mad, you wouldn't be mad if all of a sudden, you know, they moved out of state. They got called for a better job. You blessed them with a better job out of state. That's not how it works. You know, in this world, we will have to deal with people. 
all kinds of people. And I have, a, I have a thought in my heart, in my mind, that's been haunting me for about 20 years, that if somebody's in my life, perhaps, perhaps it's because God wants to either shape me or God wants to bless them through me. Somehow, some way, God will shape them or will shape you. But God is using people around you. Yes, even those that don't seem to agree with you. It's amazing to me what this guy comes up with. Such a godly man, such a good man. Hey God, let's take him out. How about that? Man, this conversation got so intense. It got like a Mexican novella. You know, uh, you guys know novella means a soap opera, right? It means like, nah, malita Alicia. They get all mad and Jeremiah gets all dramatic. Let's slaughter them. Let's take them like sheep to the slaughter. And God's like, who is this? You're my prophet. You're the pastor. You're the leader of the cell group. God, take them or I'll send them to you. And God is like, no, no. If I'd have thought that way towards you, you'd be gone. Am I making sense? But Jeremiah's mad. He's like, let's kill them, God. Let's get rid of them. I like, I like, I like his style a little bit. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. I kind of like him. But at the same time, I could see that happening so much in people. Here's what happens. He gets so mad because these people are being blessed and he's not being blessed. And he thinks that they're stealing his blessing. He thinks that whatever they're, ha they're, they're getting, he's not getting for some reason. Listen, please, please listen. Sometimes you can think that because someone else has something, Hmm. It means you're not going to get yours. I heard a pastor say, if God is blessing someone else in your hood, it's a great thing because it means he's in the neighborhood. That means that he's around you. He's somewhere there. And it just may be you who's next. I'm just thinking, if you are seeing someone else being blessed, instead of getting mad, say, God, hey, am I next? Instead of saying, God, why is that joker getting married? And I'm over here serving you, putting up chairs. Taking down speakers. Let's go. I'm over here singing my heart out. And she don't even dress cute. And he likes her. And we begin to think, no, look. And we begin to think, we begin to think that somehow, some way, that was my blessing. What the, God, that was mine. That was supposed to be for me. Why, God? Look, at, look, don't you know me, God? You know my heart. I love you. I do my devotionals. A person is a, he's a heathen. <laughs> and, uh, and you're like over here. And God is like, I love it because I feel like we think God is so broke. We think that our father God is so broke that he only has one of that kind. And he's like, dude, you love me enough. I got something, not just better, but better for you. But as a matter of fact, girls, whenever someone doesn't like you back, you should be so excited. You're like, you're, you're, in your heart, you should be like, man, I'm glad he's settling. I, I don't know if you think what I'm saying. I don't know if you, if you catch my drift. But Jeremiah's mad because someone else is getting blessed. And he doesn't realize that the blesser of the world, the one who spoke him into existence, he's on his side. He's on his side. Am I making sense? He's over here in the repartition of the, of the, of the, <laughs> of the, of the food, you know, the pantry, the bags with food. And he's thinking, oh, what about me? And the Lord's like, no, come up here. Help me distribute there's so much more that I have for you. Sometimes you see other people prosper, wicked people. People that know, don't know God nor care about God. And you're over here trying to do things right, trying not to lie on your taxes. Come on now. <laughs> trying to do things well. Man, you're trying to do things well by God. You're being honest. You're being right. And with that girl, you didn't put too many, you didn't speak too much. Yeah. Okay, in my, my day, we used to call it pimp juice, right? You didn't spill that much pimp juice because you didn't want to move so fast. You want to do things right. You want to do things right. And this other person fell five times and they're getting married. And you're thinking, did I just get to real for it? All of a sudden got to real for CFF. And you're thinking, God, I'm doing things well. What's wrong with you, God? What's wrong with you? I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with God. God can bless them. The Bible says that the sun shines upon the wicked and the righteous and the rain falls upon both as well. I'm asking you the question, do you realize that God is abundant and that God has more than enough? And if he's giving to someone, let him do it and be glad. Because God's mercy and God's grace fell on somebody else and say, God, if you gave them that much mercy, I can't wait for mine. Am I making sense? God, if you gave them, I can't wait. See, here's the thing. I have sons. And when I give my boy one thing, my other boy is right there, right behind like this. And he expects the same or bigger. I'm not even playing. He looks at it. If, if Jose gets a chocolate shake, Elijah also gets a chocolate shake. Why? Because I'm a good dad. Am I making sense? Am I making sense? Here's a crazy thing. We cannot think that God is broke. We cannot think that God is not a giving good father. Now, sometimes, sometimes we can have a dialogue that doesn't even make sense with him. But I love God because he can take your dialogue. He can take 
And I'm not saying we should be disrespectful to God like this generation is. God is my buddy. He ain't your buddy. He's your king. Uh, he's my buddy. No, no, no. I'm sorry. Leave that to the Simpsons. <laughs> Leave that to Family Guy. He's not your buddy. He's your king. He's your Lord. He's your savior. He died for you on the cross. At least be respectful. I don't care if you go to church or you don't go to church. There was a day where even the hardest cholos respected God. I grew up in a generation, I'm telling you this, where somebody tagged the church, they would get jumped. Because even they understood that there's a king and there's a Lord above them. But there's a generation of lawlessness. A generation doesn't understand that God has the power to wreck you and everything about you. And not ever even have to respond to a single word you ever say. He's a God worthy to be feared and worthy to be praised. Today, if you don't come to this church, I don't mind. It's okay. But respect the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Why? Why? Let me tell you why. Because you won't answer to me. Because there will be one day where you'll be before Him. And you won't have any excuses. No excuses at all. Every single one of us here who are here today. I want to tell you with the most love in my heart. When you decide to stand against God. You're bringing and allowing hell to come against your life. But you stand with all before the King of Kings. And you realize, hey God, I need you. I know that I cannot do this on my own. I don't know how. I've messed up so much. I don't know how to do this. But I want to walk with you. I don't want to work against you anymore. I don't want to be your enemy. Because in Christianity, there's no neutrality. When you're going uphill and you're driving a stick shift, you know. you either in Dale or in reverse. you either on the D or on the R. You're either going forward or oh my goodness. Have you ever tried to learn stick shift on an uphill? My, my, my. You sweat out of places you didn't even know you had. You sweat out of your ears, out of your hair. You are scared out of your mind. You burn that clutch like nothing. Some of you guys who are only drive automatic, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Listen, you put the e-brake, you're, you're burning it everywhere because you realize that's how Christian life is too, though. You're either going up, you're giving it all, you're going hard, or you're going backwards. There is no neutrality in Christianity. Let's go. Now, i got seven minutes, and I haven't even gotten to the good part of the sermon. Let's keep going. One more, one more, one more. All right, here we go. How long will the land mourn and the, her and the herbs of every field wither? The beasts and the birds are consumed for the wickedness of those who dwell there. Because they say, he will not see our final end. And the Lord answers. Listen, listen, listen. Jeremiah's mad at God. Look at the destruction of the people. Look how bad our land is doing. Look at the government. Look at the country. Look how we're doing, God. Because of the wickedness of the wicked. And God would say, it's not because of the wickedness of the wicked. I don't judge the world because of the wickedness of the wicked. They're wicked. They're supposed to be wicked. It's for the wickedness of those that know me. They don't know any better. They don't know me. They don't know my heart. They don't know my judge. They don't know who I am. Why would they love me or respect me? Why would they ever want to be with me if they don't know who I am? It's my people who need to walk in righteousness. It's my children who know me, who should be grateful and graceful towards the world. God will never judge the world. That would be so unfair, wouldn't it? My two-month-old, today's his two-month birthday, right? My two-month-old, I'm not going to be mad at him because can't, he, he can't brush his teeth. He doesn't even have teeth. <laughs> right? How? That's so unfair, isn't it? They're babies. Babies are babies. I don't get mad at my friends for cussing if they don't know the Lord. Listen, I'm not going to hold it against you. If you, don't, if you haven't gone to an encounter, don't even worry about it. Matter of fact, if you cuss here, it means you haven't gone to an encounter. It's all gravy. It's, oh, there you go. It's all good. I'm telling you, it's all, we're not, no one here is going to judge nothing. If, you, if they're judging you, they're wrong. God's going to judge them. Don't even worry about it. But if you walked with God, you felt his mercy, you felt his grace, you've been forgiven. Man, you had the grace to forgive others that you could never have forgiven. If you have felt the love of God over you, if the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you deny him still, and you curse with the same mouth that you praise, then God has an issue with you. But if you don't know him, I'm telling you this today, that's the grace and the love of God. He says, I, wanna, I want you to know who I am. Not so you stop cussing and doing all these things and drinking and all these things. I have nothing to do with that. I don't cheat on my wife. Not because I'm going to get caught or because somehow, some way, I committed, fine, I'm with her. But because I love that blonde. Man, that Argentina caught my heart. I'm telling you this, like, mm-mm-mm, she mine. I don't want nothing else. Let me tell you why I say that, because I'm in love. Now, I know that sounds weird for some of you guys, especially coming from me, because I'm not a romantic. Some of us think that love is this giddy butterflies. Tell you what, those butterflies leave sometimes. And but when you know someone, you really know them, and you still say, man, I, you're the best thing that ever happened to me. I love you so much. Like, you make me better. Like everything about you is a, a sign of God's grace over my life. I'm going to tell you this. You want nothing else because what you got is good enough. But here's the thing. A lot of Christians, a lot of believers, 
They're the ones that are bringing judgment upon their homes because they're not walking righteously. Man, today I told you it was going to get tough, but not tough on those that know, don't know Jesus. There's an excuse for you, and that's that you don't know. But if you don't know, <laughs> today is a good day. I didn't have to use my AK. I'm just kidding. No, today's a good time. I'm old school. So today I'm telling you this. If you know Christ, it's a great day to say, God, I'm sorry. Because I've been thinking that the land has been judged or has been going through tough times because of others. Or just because. But in reality, it's because your people haven't stood and done what they're supposed to do. I'm not mad at the politicians. I'm mad at the Christians that didn't step up and become politicians. Am I making sense? Okay. Or Dallas. I'm just kidding. Let's keep going. Number five, last one. I promise you, this is my last verse. But this is what I came for. This is where the, the title comes from. This is the one that I said, God, this is the word you have for next Friday. Like, this is it. In my garage, I've been listening while I'm welding. I'm like, mm, that's the one over and over. I, I, I put the Bible on repeat because that's the one. I said, God, this is the word for them. When, this, when uh, I think Brian, I was who asked me uh, about the, the, you know, what verse I'll be sharing the next Friday so she could prepare songs. I'm like, that's the one. I think she got so confused when she raised like, what? Let me tell you why. Here's the thing. Let's go to the next part. Here we go. Super exciting. Okay, read it with me so that you guys be as confused as she is. Ready? Say, go. If you have run with the footman and they have wearied you, then how can you continue, well, contend with horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted, they wearied you, then how will you do in the flood plain of the Jordan? I know that didn't make much sense. I know. This is God telling them, hey, hey, you're complaining? Let me, let me, let me answer to you. Let me get real with you, with Jeremiah. You gave me, you told me what you say. You told, you told me what you had in your heart. I heard you. I heard you, son. I heard you. Now let me kind of bring you back to the center. You've already had your drunken emotion moment, emotional drunk. But today, let's get real, Jeremiah. I'm going to treat you as a son, not as someone who I just met. I'm going to say, oh yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. right? I'm going to treat you as someone whom I actually know and love, and I know what you're capable of. And he's telling them, if you get tired, if you get weary with the footman, how could you raise with horses? Ah, let me go take you to another version of the Bible, the Amplified. Let's go to the next one. I'm going to illustrate it with, with a little bit of pictures. Here we go. It says, go. Okay. If you have run with men of foot, I know, and they have tired you out, meaning if you ran a race with people with feet, and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? Let me keep going. If you fall down in the land of peace where you feel secure, then how will you do, how will you do among the lions in the flooded thicket beside the Jordan? God is saying to him after he heard all his drama, He's picking him up with a spoon. The fool's all falling apart. He's like, okay, here, Jeremiah, come here. And I love that God doesn't just say, oh, you're so right. I oh, mean, I feel your pain, Jeremy. Jeremy, come here, Jeremy. Jeremy. I'm so sad too. Like, really, we should have never done this. I repent. I'm sorry. I thought I was God, but I'm not. And you are. I thought I was right, but you're right. What you feel is the most important thing. As a matter of fact, your feelings dominate over my word. That's not what he does. He says, Jeremiah, if you can't run with people, how are you going to run with horses? If you can't fight against these little things, how are you going to expect to make it to the next level? Because greater levels, you got to fight greater devils. If you're going to go higher, and I love that God expects more of his sons. I love that God doesn't see them and say, pobrecito, poor guy. I love that my God, my King says, I know what you're made of and you can run with horses. Man, you can go to the next level. I love that he doesn't just say, you're right, your past defines you. He says, no, 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 no. It's where you're going that the enemy is so scared of. Am I making sense? It's the enemy doesn't want you to get there, so he's trying to distract you right here. So get focused and realize this, that you got, man, you got to run with horses. God is telling them, here's the thing, something we don't know, but this is a little bit of background. Check this out, check this out. Back in the days, in the big battles, they used to send footmen. These were not the biggest, the, the most trained warriors. They didn't have all the equipment. They didn't have all the fancy stuff. They were just pawns. They were there to fight and to weaken the lines of the enemy. They were the footmen, you see. They were easy to take down. But after them came what? The cavalry. The horsemen. The horsemen. 
The guys that came with a big old sword and big old horses, and they would be together, they would be a unit. And if you can't handle the footmen that come before them, how are you going to expect to handle the horsemen behind them? God is saying, you're having issues in your life. They may be difficult, but they're just footmen. They're preparing you for the horsemen. I feel like God is taking some of us through some issues. Sometimes in our lives, we go through stuff. Maybe he didn't like you. That's just a footman, girl. That's a footman. Maybe you didn't get that job. Hey, that's a footman battle. Maybe just maybe you've been struggling and you keep falling down and you feel like you're, God, I can't. And God's like, hey, that's a footman battle right there. That's not the horseman. Get up. There's another one coming. Get up. There's a footman battle. Sometimes we get argumented against something someone says, especially our leadership. That's a footman battle. That's a footman battle. Please listen. That's a footman. If you can't handle that, how are you going to handle the rest? How? If you get mad right here, how are you going to get mad when you really need to be confronted face to face with some nasty things that will hurt your family? Come on, is this too much for some of you? Because God is simply telling him, and he would tell you and I the same thing. He said, if you cannot contend with these guys, if you're getting tired here, Jeremiah, I got so much more for you. So much more. You're going to run with horses. So being the geek that I am, I began to look if we humans can run with horses. Usain Bolt. Anybody know who Usain Bolt is? Fastest man in the world. Amazing. That guy's incredible. If you see him run, he looks like a man running with children. These are Olympians. He looks back when he's winning already against the best of the world. He's amazing. Amazing. He'll go like this. And he's a humble man. So I hear. Check this out. Usain Bolt runs up to 25 miles an hour. 25. Horse, 59 miles an hour. Let's say a slow horse, 45. Now here's the thing I found. And this is super cool. I don't know if you know this, but human beings are outran by most animals. Cats outrun us. Cats. Grab them by the tail. Can't even grab a cat when they, they don't want to get caught. But you know what? We can outrun just about every other animal in the world at long distance. Did you know human beings have this incredible ability that God gave us to just keep on going? And you think you can, but you put another foot next to the other. And you think you can, and you get the other See, I ran a 26.2 mile marathon and I wasn't even trained. My nails fell out. All my toenails fell out. All of them, literally. Mikey, you were my roommate back then. Were you around? Whose who shoes did I wear? Do you remember? You, you weren't there? I think well, they were Dan's shoes. Big old, big old boats, right? And so, so anyway, so they weren't tight. So I remember my nips, my nips, they were super chafed. I was like sweating. I couldn't go. I was like, man, this is so. But you know what? 26.2 miles, one after the other. <laughs> It was pride. It was pride that got me there because my girlfriend at the time said I couldn't do it. So I was like, I'm going to do it. Watch. You watch. You watch. So I ran 26.2 miles. 26.2 miles. Untrained. Not that in shape. Dude, if you're trained, if you have the right mentality, you know you could outrun just about every animal in the world. I began to read some, you know, about, you know, evolution. And that's because, you know, when we chase antelopes back then, they would outrun us. But then we keep going and we found them. Ah, oh, well, there they are. I'm like, no, that's why we made weapons. <laughs> but anyway, macro, micro evolution, we don't have time to talk about it. Here's the crazy thing. Here's the cool thing about this. We may not have the gift of being the fastest or the strongest. But man, human beings, when you have the right mindset, you can go through stuff. And you can go. The Bible says those who trust in the Lord... They will remount with winds like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not grow weary. The Bible says that you and I can not only run with horses, we can eventually outrun horses. Did you know this? That a horse can sprint only a couple miles, only two miles, all out sprint. Here's the thing. We human beings have something in our body that begins to cool us down. Horses sweat too, but we have a different kind of sweat system. See, we have these glands that begin to, to kind of calm us down and give us a pace. And when you sprint all out, your body begins to tell you, stop, slow down, because I'm going to take you further. And horses can literally blow their hearts up. That's what they need to be taken care of, analyzed. Chris and I had a racehorse. Chris, where you at? Mm, he's translating. He's laughing in there. I know he's laughing in there. Because our horse died, never even ran. It wasn't worth tacos, nothing. But you know what? The trainer was telling us this. Horses are so beautiful. They'll push them, they'll push them, and they'll go, and they'll give you everything they have. They will die for you I'm like ah that sounds awesome <laughs> at the end of the day it sucks here's why <laughs> let me tell you why it sucks you know why 
because they're not humans. They cannot keep going at a perfect pace. I feel like God is speaking to us today and he's saying, there's a moment in your life that you're going through. If you're going through hell, keep going. Keep going. You're going to make it out of it. We're going through a pandemic. It's not going through us. Am I making sense? If you're going through something, keep on going with God. Don't stop. God, I can't, man. My marriage, my finances, my heart, my, my relationship with you is trash, God. I've tried so much. And God would say, if you're falling when things are safe, if you're tired with people, how can I take you to multitudes and multitudes and multitudes? Don't grow tired of doing good. I need to finish with something. I, I, I believe that God wants me to speak about it. Luke 16, 10, it says, He who is faithful in very little things is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. God doesn't want us to do the big things. He'll take care of the big things. Oh, please listen. He wants us to take care of the little things, the small things, your devotional life. What's a devotional life? It's whatever you devote into. Anything. I'm speaking about the Word of God. I don't know how to read the word. Do you know how to read video games? Do you know how to read the titles? Do you know how to read billboards? You do. Then you could do your devotional. You could, you could. My son also does his devotional. He does. You know, kids sometimes show us up. Little kids, right? They like show us a lot. So simple, yet they can do things. You know why? Because they're awesome. <laughs> but God is asking us to be faithful in little things. I don't know. Sometimes, guys, we think we need to do these big things. How to conquer someone's heart. Small things. How to conquer a disciple to the feet of Jesus. Do the small things. You don't need to go and deliver them. right. You don't need to go, ah, shabara, shabara, praying in tongues. No, bro. Just love them. Be consistent. Pick them up when you're saying you're going to pick them up. Bless them. Bless them. Do something that God's asking you to do. You cannot do everything. But you can be faithful with 10%. God's going to give you way much more. I promise you that. Don't worry. The offering talk over your You're not going to give again. I'm just telling you this simple. God wants to see faithfulness before he ever gives you fruitfulness faithfulness first amen i want to pray for you any of you here but i want to pray for those that do not know god the bible says in romans chapter 8 i want us to see it all together who shall separate us from the whole from the love of christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for your sake we are killed all day long this was written by the way around Nero Nero was a horrible emperor who literally burned Christians who threw them in the Colosseum with beasts so they could be eaten alive the Colosseum would be painted red the whole bottom would be painted red by the blood of Christians all day long we are killed all day long we are accounted a sheep for the slaughter for I am persuaded meaning something's moving in me that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing, 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 nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. No matter what we're going through, God says, I love you, and that's enough. That's sufficient for you. If you're here today, I want to tell you, no matter what's been happening in your life, God loves you so much and nothing can separate you from his love. No one, no demon, no angel, nothing, nothing ever can separate you from the love of God. That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. That's why we have that keyboard, that guitar, these screens. Why are we here? Because God loves you. Because God loves you. If it was just you in this world, he would have died just for you. And here's the thing. The one thing I told you about Revelations is 854. And in this next six minutes, you will hear me speak as I've never preached before because I don't normally talk eschatology. But the Lord put it in my heart. He revealed something. And I don't speak much of Revelation. You know that. I try to stick very pragmatic. But when God reveals something, I must say it. And it led me to the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verse 1 through 8. I'm not going to show it because kids are going to get freaked out. Take it out, actually. But I need you to understand something. 
When Revelation speaks, it talks about the end times, the times where all of us will get to at some point or another. I believe that we're closer than we've ever been before. And I don't want to sound like those people that, oh, the Aztec calendar is going to end, and the world's going to end. And Y2K, I lived through Y2K. I know you guys don't even know what Y2K is. Everybody thought the world was going to end in 2000. Remember that? Georgie, were you there? It was funny. You were, it was funny, huh? Everybody was freaking out. No water in anywhere. All the stores were empty. I if the world's going to end, you're not going to need water. <laughs> but everybody thought the world was going to end. It was, it was crazy. And we made it through Y2K. <laughs> we were like, yeah. Okay, listen. Here's the crazy thing. Everybody wants to know. Everybody thinks, oh, the world's going to end this. The world's going to end. You know, the world's going to end when my king decides. And I don't decide. But you know what you do decide? is to be ready for when God calls you home. Here's the thing. There's this four horsemen on the apocalypse. Some of you guys might have heard it. You hear it on video games. I don't know all different things and poems and rap songs. Four horsemen of the apocalypse. Four horsemen. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 through, 1 through, 7, through 8, uh, 6, Revelation 1 through 8. Now, nah, Revelation 6, verses 1 through 8, talks about these horsemen. I'm not going to read it all to you. I'm going to explain to you what these four horsemen are. They're simple, and they're there in the Bible. They're described. I don't have time to tell you at all. But the first horseman is a white horse, and it represents the Antichrist. It's fake peace, where everything seems perfect, where politics all of a sudden begin to agree throughout the world, where everything begins to be one, one coin, one world order. Everything begins to become one. And it's a fake peace. It's not a peace that God gives. It's a peace that the world offers. It's called the Antichrist. It's going to seem amazing. It's going to seem like the best times. I feel like we've already passed those. But maybe they're still coming. There's another horse. It's a red horse. And the rider with a large sword, the Bible says. That horse, man, brings war and disaster. Wars throughout, they break. Disasters throughout the world. Things that people, geologists, cannot explain. Left and right, people die. Why? Because there's a judgment, and he's the second horseman of the apocalypse. The third horseman is a black horse. His rider is holding a pair of scales, the balance between right and wrong. After this war, famine will come, financial inflation. Things are going to get so expensive. People won't be able to buy even food. The Bible talks about these things. It's going to get so difficult, so tough. People are going to begin to fight one another. It's going to be so hard. Because this resource, we have outgrown our world. There's too much. I'm not talking about global warning. I'm not talking about, we know we're, we're too many. I'm telling you that the Bible says that there's a horseman coming. And he's in a black horse. And he has a scale. And he's saying that after these wars, great famines will come. And then after that, there's a fourth horseman. The fourth horseman is a pale horse. A rider named Death and Hades following close behind it. That's literally what it says. A rider named Death. And Hades following right behind. Hades means hell. Meaning that last four, the last horseman ushers the gates of hell against the people. Listen to this. It says, and it's described in detail, that these are death and disease. Pestilence throughout the entire world. Before I preach this, I need you to know something. When this message used to be preached in churches, people would laugh or think within themselves, ah, pastor, we're so far away. I used to watch movies of like the end of the world kind of thing. And now it's like, hold on, that's a little too real right there. Hold on a second. No, 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 no. I don't want to watch this right now. You guys ever seen a movie lately? Like Independence Day kind of thing where aliens come? You're like, okay, I don't believe in aliens. Like, ah, but I know that things can get crazy. Because we've experienced something called pestilence. We've experienced a disease that something so tiny, so small brings fear. Where people have to wear four face masks. Don't even hug you, touch you. Don't say hi to you anymore. In the streets, you cannot, people don't even want to look at each other. Because they're afraid of sickness. This is not in the U.S. only. Papa, this is happening all over the world. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to get you to understand something. If you cannot run with a footman, how then will you contend with horses? If you can't stand today, what will you do then? Church, what will we do when things get really tough? What will you do when the government says you can't preach no more? Well, that's illegal. Church, who will come? I'm asking you, who will come? When in the word of God tells us something and the culture tells you something else. What will the church do when pestilence comes and the answer seems to delay? Will you still trust God? My answer, me, I have chosen to say yes to God. Whether sickness or death, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing. No created thing. No thing to come. No one. Can I tell you this? Your battles today are preparing you for the conquest of tomorrow. Don't think that your battle today is as big as it's going to get. God is preparing you for a greater, much, much greater, much greater. And that should excite you. Let me tell you why. Because with a greater conquest, there's greater opposition. Always, always, always. And here's the thing. I read the whole Bible. 
I know what the end of it says. Guess what? We win. We win. I read the book. I don't know if you've seen it. Whenever you're, you know, you're watching an episode and your wife goes ahead of you on the, the episodes, you know, the, the, the Netflix thing. And she goes ahead and you're like, hey, dude, you were supposed to wait for me. And you walk into the wrong time because you see now that, dude, she didn't die. She didn't die. I thought she was dead. No, she's alive. Why didn't you wait for me? And now you know the end. You're like, ah. it's not as exciting anymore. You're not as scared anymore. You know why? Because you've seen the end. Well, guess what? I've read the Bible. I know what my God says. He stands true to time. He doesn't work on the way you and I work. He's in an ever-present continuum. That means some, what? Ever-present continuum means is that he's always there. Before, today, tomorrow, he'll always be there. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. He was there in the pre He will be there at the end. You know what that means? That at the end of the day, he wins. He wins. He wins. He wins. And if he wins, those that are with him will also win. Now, my question is this. If you cannot run with a footman, how then will you contend with a horseman? With pestilence, with financial troubles, with wars, with fake peace. Run with footmen and realize it's just preparation. I am so excited for the church today. I have something in my belly, something in my heart that God has propped. He's moved it. He's doing something. I'm so pumped. I told Leoni, I said, Mamor, we need to show our children what sacrificing for the king means. I'm not talking about chickens, by the way. I'm talking about my own life. I'm talking about, God, we need to do something. God, we got to do more. I told you guys, I have four jobs I do, and God spoke to me this year. You need to let go of everything. Just all I got, I just need you for me. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else. God, what about everything? Don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of it all. God needs everything of you and me. I'm not saying go quit your jobs, by the way. I'm just saying, what's the level, what's the level of commitment God's calling you to? Stop fighting with footmen. Stop getting so mad when your mom says something. Or when your brother cusses you out. It's a footman. It's a footman. You're ready to run with horses. I'm not saying to hey, you're a footman. No, 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 no. They're going to be like, what the heck? You should have gone to the other church. I told you. They're washing your brain. They are because it was dirty. <laughs> Listen, I'm just saying in your heart and your mind, you must know when you're going through something, God, thank you so much. Thank you for the footman. Thank you for the footman. God, thank you for the footman. Because I know, I know I'm meant to run with a horseman. Amen. Why don't you stand up with me before I keep on going? Let's stand up and let's pray. I, I finish right at nine, guys. Right at nine. Stand up with me. I want to pray for the two, two groups of people. I believe those two are many times confused into one, but there's two kinds of people. The people that see God, and when they see Him, they realize that they need Him. And there's those people, when they see God, they think God needs them. Only two kinds. I'm not coming to you, God. You better come to me. And that's just not how it works, bro. It doesn't. It really, really doesn't. Here's my king, my lord, my savior. He's offering you everything he has. But don't get it twisted. Not for one moment. Don't get it wrong. He doesn't owe you, Jack. He doesn't owe you a thing. Let other churches preach you a little different. But today I'm going to tell you the truth. God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't need us. He loves us. I don't know about you. I would rather be loved than needed. I would rather, I don't know, if, if Whitney asked me for a ride... And then again, another ride. Hey, can I get another, another ride? Hey, can I borrow your car again, again, again? I don't mind, you know, because we love Whitney. But if she doesn't know me, she don't care about me, and she just asks for my car because she needs it, how many of you guys know that's not cool? When there's love, when there's love, when there's intimacy, when you know, it's amazing. God, take whatever you want. Take it. I love you. I love you so much. I'm not, I'm not being cheap on you today. I love you so much. Take my heart, take my life, take my mornings, take my nights. I love you. I want to be with you. Prepare me today, this morning, for my horsemen. Prepare me this morning for my footmen as well. Today, I ask you guys, close your eyes, please. Whether you've been struggling with drugs, with addiction, with alcohol, with selfishness, with anger, with sadness, with resentment, depression, in the name of Jesus, I declare these footmen are nothing they belong under your feet I declare right now that any of you here who have been struggling with your family fighting non-stop I declare that your eyes will be lifted you will no longer contend not get tired no 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 that says lift up your eyes this is preparation to love the love the ones that don't deserve to be loved in your eyes I want to put my heart in yours I want to show you how to be someone who runs with footmen 
I want to change your mentality from a soft, easily offended believer to a disciple of Jesus Christ who has the words to tell Jesus, everybody else can go, God, but where will I go? If you alone have the words of eternal life. If you could today say, God, I stand in the test of, this foot, of these footmen. I will one day stand to the test of the horsemen. God, I want you and you alone. I want you more than anything. Whether she or he likes me, whether they care or not, I love you so much. If you want to give your life to Jesus today, if you realize that you have been walking alone and not with him. Everybody else have your eyes closed. I have my eyes open so I don't trip out of this thing, out of this, this board. But, but I'm going to ask you guys this, please. Everybody with your eyes closed so nobody else sees nothing. It's just you and God right now. Everybody else, eyes closed, just you and God. If you want to say to God, God, I've been living for myself. I don't care if, you're, if you've been a 12. I don't care if you sing. I don't, man, that, that doesn't mean anything to God. This is real. This is him saying to you, if you've been living for yourself, this is the time to relent and to say, God, I need you. I love you. I want you more than ever. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God, because I got tired with the footman. But today, God, I get up and I say to you, Lord, I want to run with the horses. God, I want your purpose in my life. I want your direction in me. God, I don't want to be weighed down always. I want to stand and run with you, God. I need you. I want you, Lord. I realize, Jesus, that you died on the cross. Would you repeat this simple prayer with me and repent? And tell him, God, I'm sorry for all my sins. I'm sorry, God, for offending you. I'm sorry, God, for the tears that I've caused people that never should have cried for me, God. Tell him, God, I'm sorry for my selfishness. I'm sorry, God, God, please forgive me if I thought you weren't as good as you are. Forgive me, God, if I thought I knew better. Forgive my pride. Forgive my ego. Forgive me, God, if I doubted you. Forgive me, God. Forgive me, God. Forgive my words that cussed, that cursed instead of blessed. Forgive my feet that walked me in the wrong direction. God, forgive me, God. Would you please cleanse my hands that you were used to do evil things. Instead, God, I want to use these hands to, pray, to praise you, to bless you, and to bless other people. God, would you take my life and my dreams and my past and my future. I give you all that I am and all that I have. Jesus, I'm yours today. I'm yours today. I'm yours, God. I want to be in your side. Thank you for dying on the cross and to pay for my sins. The wage of death, which is death. The wage of sin which is death thank you jesus for paying on the cross you're my lord and you're my savior in your name i pray now let me pray for the rest of you god i ask you right now for a mentality change at cff god the disciples who make disciples will arise a different mentality god god would you please remove remove god a heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh sensitive to you spirit of god God, forgive us if we gotten mad at the delayed blessing. God, if our heart had been sick because we haven't seen the prosperity in an area. Today we trust you, we tell you we love you, and we know, we know that your hand is always, always, always upon us. God, today we confess, we confess, God, that you are good and you're faithful. Today, God, we declare that we will walk with you and nothing shall separate us from your love, God. Nothing, God, nothing. No matter what comes, God, we are with you and we are with you forever, God. No matter what happens, we're with you, Lord. Jesus, we love you so much. And this church, this church praises your name today, Friday night. We praise you, God. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. Thank you, Pastor, for that incredible word. If you're a you blessed never person, stop you to share with your friends and Even family. when I see it, you work. Even when I... Why don't you lift up your hands to God?